Okay, the topic today is we're looking at all the different organisms so far. We've covered plants and fungi and bacteria and protists, and now we move on to animals. So um, what, what characteristics are true to make something part of the animal kingdom? Well, first of all, they have to be multicellular. No, there are no single-celled animals. At some stage in their life, they need to be modal. So there are some animals that the adult stage is not modal, but the larva stage or at some point, they're modal during their life. They don't have a cell wall, and they're heterotrophic, meaning that they have to, they cannot photosynthesize. They have to actually ingest their food. And most ingest, digest, absorb, and then eliminate waste. Another important component of what constitutes an animal has to do with their development. So during animal development, the first stage when the sperm and egg fuse is called the zygote. So that's the first new cell of the, of the new organism. Now what happens in development is this zygote begins to divide. So one cell divides into two cells and two divide into four. And this goes on for a while. It's, it's a fast um, division, but not overall growth. And we call that cleavage. But the important thing about animals is they all reach this blastula stage where essentially the cells have formed this circular layer, okay, um, around a hollow ball. So this is the blastula, and all animals go through this particular stage. Another important feature about animals is they secrete what we call extracellular matrix. And so this is outside of the cell. The cells are producing these, and this is outside of the cell, and it can have many different kinds of features that hold the cells and tissues together, um, like bone would be an example of something that living cells in an extracellular matrix, um, collagen, okay, lots of different types of tissues. Now, I want to talk about some features that we use to classify animals. So one of the first is animals can either be vertebrates or invertebrates. And, and this is just simply do they have a spinal column or not? And so today our focus is going to be on invertebrates, those organisms that do not have a, a spinal column. Now invertebrates make up about 97% of all animals. So when you think about an animal, the first thing that comes to your mind might be a bear or a cheetah or a dog. Obviously, these are all vertebrates, but really, when you look at all the species of animals, the majority of them are going to be invertebrates. Now, in just a minute, we're going to talk about the body plan of organisms. So we look at what kind of symmetry different animals have, and that's one of the, way that they're, one of the ways that they're classified into different groups. Another important thing we're going to look at is something called the coelom. And this has to do with a, the body cavity. Um, and so we'll look at that in just a minute. Another way that they're classified is dependent on the first opening in embryonic development, whether it is the mouth or it is, whether it is the anus. So if the first opening that forms is the mouth, it's a protostome. And if the first opening is the anus, then it's a deuterostome. Most animals are going to reproduce by sexual reproduction, although there are some that can reproduce asexually by budding or fragmentation. Another important feature of animal development is called the gastrula. So after the blastula, it begins to go on, and then the cells begin to form this invagination which is called, the, it's, this is called gastrulation, and this opening eventually is going to become um, the digestive system. And so during gastrulation, the organism or the animal actually forms three different, what we call germ layers, and we'll talk about those three layers in just a minute, and what, at that point, each of those germ layers is destined to become a certain type of cell or tissue. Another term I want us to think about as we go through these different animal phyla is cephalization. So this term essentially means 
you have nervous cells or the nervous system that be it, it be it's concentrated into one region of the organism so the anterior or toward the head so think about a brain right would be cephalization where we have a concentration of nervous tissue in that region another important component i want to mention to you is some some genes that are called hox genes so it's more than one but these group of genes are, are grouped together because essentially what they are known to do is determine the general body plan. Where, where's the head? Where's the thorax? Where's the tail? Or where are the appendages? Um, where do these things form in the developing embryo? And the interesting thing is across many animals, this, the DNA sequences that make up these genes are similar from one animal species to another. So I mentioned that we wanted to talk a little bit about body plan or symmetry. So here's an example of either no symmetry or two different types of symmetries that animals can have. And so this first one, asymmetry meaning there is no symmetry. The only animals who have this type of symmetry, okay, is going to be the first phylum that we're going to talk about periphera and the organisms are sponges and so what's shown here is a sponge and that means it doesn't matter how you try to slice this in half or cross there just isn't any symmetry there okay radial symmetry is when you're slicing it essentially um, like you would slice a pizza or a pie that if you slice it this way you have two halves that are equal if you slice it this way you have two halves this way this way so radially there's symmetry there. So a good example of radial symmetry is going to be a jellyfish or as we see here a sea anemone. The third type of symmetry is bilateral symmetry and this is when you have a mirror image. So you have a left side and you have a right side just like you see here with this goat. So a couple terms I want to make sure we understand. Dorsal meaning relates to the back, okay, whereas the opposite of that would be ventral that relates to the front. Anterior relates to the head, whereas posterior relates to the tail. So I'll move, oops, excuse me, yeah, we'll move forward to, we'll talk a little bit more about embryonic development in animals. And so as I mentioned, during the gastrulophase, so here's our zygote, the first cell when a sperm and an egg meet. You have cell division through something called cleavage, and you get this mass of cells. Cleavage continues until you reach this blastula stage, which is unique to animals. It's, it's a hollow ball, hollow ball or a fluid-filled ball of cells. And then as the development goes further from the blastula, we get to this gastrula. So you, the important thing to see here is this invagination or this folding in, right? And this is the, the primitive gut, right, or what will become the digestive canal. Now, in gastrulation, there is the commitment or the development of three different types of germ layers or tissues. So the first is the ectoderm. And the ectoderm is destined to become skin or nervous system. The mesoderm will become muscles could be, and could be circulatory system. And the endoderm is going to be eventually the digestive tract. So not all animals are going to have all three germ layers. So this is one way that animals are differentiated into different phyla. Okay, I also mentioned to you the first opening. So when this first invagination occurs and we have this opening, what does this eventually become? If it becomes the mouth, then those organisms are called protostomes. If it becomes the anus, they're called deuterostomes. We happen to be deuterostomes. So our, the first opening there becomes the anus. Um, another group that are deuterostomes are the echinoderms. And we'll talk about both of these groups we'll talk about next week. But echinoderms are, for example, sea stars, um, sea urchins, 
those would belong to this group. So we'll get to those next week. Now let's talk about the body cavity and how different animals can have different types of body cavities. So the first, if it has a true coelom, this means that the body cavity um, is completely lined with mesoderm and, and therefore has a fluid filled area. So um, this drawing right here is what a true coelom would look like. So in blue, we show the ectoderm. That's one of the germ layers. And then the green represents the mesoderm. And so you see that the mesoderm is completely lining all around this, this in peach or in this light pink color. That's the coelom or the body cavity. And then in the very interior, you see the endoderm. Okay, examples of, of animals who have true coelums like this are the annelids, the mollusks, the arthropods, the echinoderms, which we'll get to next week, and the chordates. So we'll talk excuse me, about each of those later on tonight. Those that do not have um, a coelom, example would be flatworms. So they just have the three germ layers and a digestive cavity. There's no lining um, of the mesoderm at all in the, in the <clears throat> cavity. And then there are organisms that are called pseudocoelomates, and that's because they have a partially lined digestive tract, but not all the way. So an example would be the roundworms. I want to mention one other term to you. So we sometimes we'll talk about a hydrostatic skeleton. So remember, the organisms tonight we're, we're talking about are invertebrates, so they don't have a true internal skeleton. However, they do, they can contain fluid um, and, and therefore their muscles can push against this constrained fluid, therefore we call that a hydrostatic skeleton. Let's take just a minute to look at um, the, the phylogeny of some of the um, animals. And so we're, we're going to look down here, this group right here, periphera, these are the sponges. So these are the, the absolute simplest of all animals, okay? As we'll learn in a minute, they don't have true tissues. Um, they're they're the, the simplest animal. And so as you work your way up, we eventually see here's here's chordates, which is a group that we would belong in. So what I want you to notice about this phylogeny is that this tells us there's no true tissues here. So everything else in this tree is going to have true tissues. Okay. Um, this here tells us that these organisms have radial symmetry, and we'll talk more about the nadarians later that include the jellyfish. Okay, um, bilateral symmetry here. So all the other organisms are going to have bilateral symmetry. So arthropods and nematodes, platyhelminthus, annelida, mollusca, echinoderms, all of those are going to have bilateral symmetry. Here's the other feature that we talked about, protostomes versus deuterostomes. So as you see, the two groups that are deuterostomes are chordates, like us, and echinoderms. This is something that you might want to refer back to after we go through and talk about the different phyla tonight, just to see how that they relate and some of the features that we discuss. So our first phylum that we're going to discuss is phylum periphera. So these include the sponges, and as I mentioned to you, these have no symmetry. So this is the only group of animals that do not have any kind of symmetry. Now I mentioned to you that one of the common features for all animals is that they're modal, and the adults of these sponges, they're just attached to a substrate just growing, right? They're sessile, meaning they're non-modal. However, they do have a stage. Their larvae are actually swimming larvae. So they do have a stage in which they're modal. Okay, how do they get their energy? Where do they get their source of energy? Well, they have pores all over their body. And water flows in through the pores 
and then it exits out the top. They do not have a head, but they have something called an osculum at the top, and the water comes into the pores and out the top, and while the water is flowing through the organism, simple diffusion is how they get their nutrients right out of the water, and that's how they exchange their gases. So they take oxygen in from the water, and they release carbon dioxide out into the water. Now they accomplish this by two important types of cells. They don't have true tissues, okay, no true tissues, so they certainly don't have the germ layers, but they do have specialized cells. So the first, the, the coanocytes, and the second cell type that we're going to talk about are the amoebocytes, and we'll, we'll look at how do they function for the sponge on the next slide. But let's talk a minute about how do they reproduce. Well, they can reproduce asexually just by budding or a fragment breaking off and becoming a separate organism. Or they can reproduce by sexual reproduction. They're actually hermaphroditic, meaning they have both sex. They can produce sperm and egg. Um, the sperm are released, and then fertilization of the oocyte or the egg actually occurs internally. And then at some stage, the larva is released to swim. The larva finds a, a spot to attach and then grow into the adult. So let's look just for a second about these two cell types that I want us to look at. Because remember, no true tissues. But the coenocytes, the way that they function, their job, because they have flagella, is for their flagella to move together. And when they do that, it creates a water current that essentially draws water in through the pores of the organism. And when the water's drawn in, then the organism traps food by phagocytosis, which just means it sort of surrounds and engulfs the food. Um, these, these types of cells are lined on the inner body wall. So if we if we look here, here's, here's the sponge, and this part's blown up big for us so we can see what this looks like. So this would be an example of one of these cells, how it lines the body wall. And when these flagella move, okay, it brings water in through these open pores. Okay, these cells can also differentiate into sperm and travel out of the organism and go find another sponge to fertilize. By sexual reproduction. Now the amoebocytes are named that because they move like amoeba. Remember we talked about amoeba in the protist chapter, so the amoeba kind of look like globs as they move around. So these will eventually, they can differentiate into the eggs, and some of them can also deliver the swimming sperm to the eggs. Okay, we're going to we're going to move on to the next phylum, which is Nidaria. So the the C is silent. Say it just like if it wasn't there. These are mostly marine meaning in the ocean, but you do find a few species that live in fresh water, but they're all aquatic. These now, so remember, sponges had no symmetry. These are going to have radial symmetry, so they're this from the top, right? You can slice them um, lots of different ways. They don't have all three germ layers, but they do have two. And they come in either a medusa body plan or a polyp body plan, or some of them may have both body plans at some point in their life. So this is the Medusa body plan that looks sort of like this, right, top down. So an example of that would be a jellyfish. And this is the polyp body plan, so where the tentacles are sort of up. And so an example of this would be a sea anemone. So what are some of their features? Well, they have they perform extracellular digestion they have a gastrovascular cavity where they release enzymes to digest and then they absorb the nutrients 
they do not have a digestive tract. It's incomplete because they only have one opening, meaning it goes in that opening and the waste has to come back out the same opening. So their gas exchange, just like uh, sponges, occurs simply by diffusion. Oxygen diffuses into the cells, carbon dioxide diffuses into the water. They have a simple nerve net of nervous tissue. Um, reproduction, similar, they, they can reproduce asexually by budding or fragmentation, or they have a sexual reproductive option, which is they produce sperm and eggs, and they release that into the water. And so fertilization of the egg by the sperm occurs in the water as external fertilization. The larva stage then is going to be a swimming larva. So here's an example, uh, a, a, another look at the polyp body plan. So you see here's a sea anemone. And you can see the internal, the, the gastrovascular cavity. And one thing we're going to talk about in just a minute are these specialized stinging cells that are, that are known for nadarians, and they're called nidocytes. So if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, it, it was these cells that were responsible for that. Um, and so here's the mouth region. Okay, so food's entering and exiting the same opening, or the waste is exiting the same opening. Okay, so that was the polyp body plan. This is the medusa body plan, so you can see the jellyfish here. Okay, and here's the opening, the mouth anus, right, where food comes into the gastrovascular, cav gastrovascular cavity, and then it must exit out the same opening. There's only one. Now let's take a look at these specialized stinging cells that are found in the nadarian phyla, nidocytes. So these can deliver toxins. They can be painful. They can even be deadly. And so um, these, these cells have something in them that are called nematocysts. And essentially, you can think of this like a coiled thread that's ready right, to be released. And they have these. Um, essentially like a sensor and when they're touched this this just shoots out okay and so this would be what it looks like before and then as if this is triggered then this is what it looks like when it fires so this is what's happened if you've ever had a jellyfish sting okay our third phyla to talk about is the phylum platyhelminthes. And so these include flatworms, tapeworms, and flukes. Many of these are parasites, meaning that they are feeding and living and harming a host. Um, there are some free living. So the example that you're looking at over here is a planarian. <clears throat> they also have asexual or sexual reproduction op options. If they do reproduce sexually, the, the fertilization is internal. And they're monoecious, meaning they're also herma hermaphrodites. They have both, they can produce both sperm and egg. Now, this is the first phylum we've talked about tonight where we have the presence of all three derm layers, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. This is also the first organism that we've talked about that has bilateral symmetry. So sponges, no symmetry. Nadarians, radial symmetry. Platyhelminthes or flatworms, bilateral symmetry. Now, these do not have a coelom. Instead, it's a solid body. So the, the exchange of gases comes directly across the body wall. They also have extracellular digestion. A couple of interesting things to point out is they do have a way that they get rid of their nitrogenous waste. So it's an excretory system. And you can see the canals here running, okay, 
where it says excretory canal. That's how they get rid of their nitrogenous waste. They also have nerve cords that go down both sides, and you can see that there's a concentration there that at the anterior end or the end by the head that as all actually has photosensory capability. So we're seeing more cephalization as we move up. Okay, tapeworms, no fun, are one type of flatworm. And these guys, they have um, a sucker on their mouth where they can attach, right, and feed at the anterior end, or it's sometimes called a scolex, so you can see what that looks like where they will attach. There are these units of a tapeworm called proglottids that get released in the feces of an infected animal. How does an animal become infected? Well, usually it's either by drinking contaminated water or eating a food source that's contaminated with these proglottids or the eggs of this organism. Now if you look at this life cycle, what happens is the larva then begins to grow in the muscle. So for example, let's say of a pig, right? The muscle that grows in the muscle of a pig. And then how do we encounter the tapeworms? Well, if, we're eat, if we eat raw or undercooked meat that has the larva in the muscle, then that's how we can acquire these tapeworms that will have fun and sit down and attach in our intestines and absorb all of our nutrients. Next phyla to talk about is mollusca or the mollusks. So the most diverse of all the invertebrate phyla are the arthropods, and that's the last one we'll talk about tonight. But second to that are the mollusks. So what's important about these? They're soft-bodied, segmented animals. They have bilateral symmetry. They have a complete digestive tract. That's the first time we've seen that tonight. And they have a true coelom or the digestive or the body cavity lined with mesoderm. The couple of really specific things to this phyla are that they have a what we call a muscular foot that allows them to move. We'll talk a little bit more about that because it, it differs for some of the different groups. There's four groups here of mollusks. They also have what's called a mantle this mantle is responsible for secreting calcium carbonate, which will become a shell. So think about a snail, okay? And think about that's where this shell comes from, is it's produced from their mantle. They also have something called a radula, which is a tongue-like strap that has teeth made of chitin that they can use to grab and tear food. So let's talk about the four groups. There are the the Kit, the chitons, or the chitons, the bivalves, which are oysters and clams. So think about they are they are attached at one end and they open and close. The gastropods, which are the snails or slugs, and then the cephalopods, um, which are the octopus and the squid. So all of these are mollusks. Let's go through um, and, and look at each of these groups. So these are named for these eight overlapping flat shells that look like, like shingles. Okay. The bivalves, so here's some, some oysters you see here, are, are essentially hinge shells, oysters, clams, um, trying to think of some other examples right now, but those those hinged sea creatures, okay? The gastropods are snails and slugs. Gastropod means stomach-footed because essentially their stomach is that muscular foot I mentioned, and that's how they are going to move. 
The cephalopods, uh, cephalopod means head foot. And so the reason that they're named that way, you think about an octopus or a squid, essentially these tentacles all extend from the head, right? So the, that's why they're called head footed. Now, I just want to say one more thing um, before we move on. And then as I mentioned to you that they have a mantle and that the mantle secretes calcium carbonate to make to make for a shell. Okay, that's in most species. So some species it will be an internal um, shell, but in some it's absent like in the octopus. Okay, moving on, we are at the Annelida phylum or annelids. So as you see here, this is an earthworm. And so the earthworm is part of this phyla. And what are important to know about these? Well, they're segmented. And you can look at this worm and see there's these tiny little segments right all along the worm. I want to point out to you this one specialized area of the worm. We'll get there in just a second. Even though you might look at that and think that it has radial symmetry, it does not. It has bilateral symmetry um, because you cannot cut this any direction and get symmetry. It's, it's like a human. You can, it has mirrored sides, so it's bilaterally symmetrical. So besides earthworms, leeches and something called polychaetes are also part of the phylum Annelida. Gas exchange occurs across the body wall by diffusion. They have a simple brain, so we have cephalization there in the anterior end by the head. They have a complete digestive tract, so there is mouth and anus present in these annelids. The structure that I circled here is an important component of annelids called the clitellum. And this actually is part of their reproductive system. It generates mucus, which allows sperm to transfer. And it also becomes a cocoon for fertilization. Okay, so we, we've so far tonight we've talked about just phyla. Okay, this, this is actually a super phylum, meaning it's going to contain more than just one phylum. But there are some um, relationships between those two phylum, and they share certain characteristics. So this super phylum is called exozoa. Sorry, that's a mouthful. And, and this super phylum is going to include, whoops, I have it here for you. The nematodes, or phylum nematoda, and arthropods, or phylum arthropoda. So what do these, these phyla share in this superphylum? Well, first of all, they have something we're going to call a cuticle, an external covering. We could call it an exoskeleton. And it's made of this really tough polysaccharide called chitin. We talked about that a little in 1408, if you took 1408. And therefore, because this is a hard um, outer covering, it can't grow with the organism. So these organisms have to molt, meaning that as they grow, they have to shed their old outer cuticle and produce a new one as they get larger and larger. So the first phyla there, nematoda, these are the round worms. So like the annelids, even though you might think they have radial symmetry, they don't. They have bilateral symmetry because they actually have a left and a right mirror side. They're not the same all the way around. They have a pseudocelum, so they're partially lined with mesoderm. There are some free living and there are some that are parasites. They do have a complete digestive tract, meaning they have both mouth and anus. So they take in food in one end and the waste is released at the other end. And they have cephalization. They have a brain concentrated at the anterior or the head end. Now I want to mention to you because th these are uh, organisms that can cause some definite 
yucky diseases. So the first one that you see here, um, this is kind of small, but this is the life cycle um, of this nematode. So this is a parasitic one, clearly. And you see that it has multiple larva stages that make it through several different organisms. Okay, um, And the human then becomes infected when we drink unfiltered water that's been contaminated with these particular worms. So this figure here is showing you the blister that comes up about a year after infection. And so after about a year, this female worm is going to come back to the skin so that they can release the larva. Okay, hookworms are also an intestinal parasite that are caused by these roundworms or nematodes that animals can get. Trichinella is another species of roundworm or nematode that's parasitic. This we can get if we eat undercooked pork. So it then it finds its way to our intestines and hangs out there and takes advantage of our nutrients. So the last phyla we're going to discuss tonight is arthropoda or arthropods. These are the most diverse of all of the animal species. About 85% of all known animal species are arthropods, so they make up the vast majority of animals. What's interesting and specific about these is they have jointed legs, as you see in the examples that I've shown here. They have segmented bodies, so their bodies are not all the same from front to back. They have different segments that play different roles. They have this tough exoskeleton that we mentioned made of chitin. So some of the groups within arthropods, insects are arthropods, arachnids or eight-legged things like spiders, millipedes, centipedes, crustaceans like lobster and crabs, and scorpions like you see here. Interesting characteristic about these is you see sexual dimorphism, meaning the males may have a different appearance than the females. In the same species. These also have larva stages. We have a little more advanced circulatory system with a heart and we have a respiratory system present that actually branches throughout the body and opens up into these little openings called spiracles where it causes the air to flow in to the body of the organism. So next week we'll pick up with Echinoderms and chordates, but that will finish us off tonight for invertebrates.